well they don't do it, it keeps me employed. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, you know, you guys train, you go to, uh, yeah, you go to uni, you go, you do your extra training courses, so some massage therapists are going to be, you know, every technique on how to torture a person under the sun and others just do this and that's all they do. Podiatry is no different. You'll have general practitioners and the only way to do it really is that you, you know, go in there, sit with them. If they tell you to piss off, they're not a very nice person anyway, so don't bother referring to them. But if you go in there and look at how they work, what they do, and if you feel within your expertise that'll be helpful to your treatment base, then you use them as a referral agent. I mean, I've got, my referral base is uh, people I've had for 20 to 30 years. They won't go anywhere else. I can't get rid of them. Well, because they know I work hard and I work. You know, people come in and they say, oh, you're good. Patient, someone told me you were good. All I know is I try to keep up and I work hard for that patient. And, you know, I don't get results all the time. Some people are beyond results or some people don't really want them. But as far as a practitioner is concerned, the official line, you ring up the association, they'll give you three names in your area and you try them out. Um, I, you know, if a patient of yours has got orthotics, ask them. How did you find the practitioner? How do you find the orthotics helping you? How hard were they to get used to? Right? Uh, how much did they cost? You know, if they're wearing a piece you know, of, of Vasilia or an ICB and it costs them 400 bucks, use somebody else. Right? That's, you know, that, that's, that's the orthotic name. Yeah, it's a commercial product. So a lot of practitioners will use commercial products. You guys have probably used them too. Do I hate commercial products? No, I think they're great. A lot of them are good. I just people think people over-service with them and they charge too much for them. And they classify them as prescriptive orthotic devices and half the time they're not even customised. And that's wrong. But as far as if you, you just got to sit with them, go in there. You know, I have all sorts of people coming in and out of my surgery, it drives me nuts sometimes. You know, not only work experience, I get students from the uni, physio students, I get practitioners. I mean, the only chiropractors I deal with are the ones that have either been patients or they've come in to talk to me about what they want to do. As far as I'm concerned, for my referral base, if I don't know you, I'm not going to give you anything. Because I, I mean, sometimes when you're at the SMA or you're networking, you can meet people and you find out who knows what through that sort of network. That's fine. Word of mouth is terrific. But if you don't know the person, I wouldn't... I'd love president of the association. Use all podiatrists, they're all excellent and they're fantastic. I mean, most of them are pretty good guys. Some of them, they don't have the skills. They don't want the skills. They get forced to do things that they don't want to. Same with medicos, doctors, whatever. If you're referring to an orthopaedic surgeon, you're not just going to do the bloke down the road. You're going to find out what he does for your patients, aren't you? So that's probably the best advice I can get. You know, and if you do deal with somebody that you know well, that's good, and you need a podiatrist for someone else that's not in that area, ask him. He should know who he trusts. Ask him who he'll send his family to. And they are, they are around. It's just a matter really of, of getting that network going. So is that all right? Make sense? Um, yeah, we went through that. Four foot deviations is in your notes. So it's a four foot varus. Supernatus, the four-foot alignment formula. Four-foot alignment, now sometimes patients are stuffed before they start because they've got a short big toe. So usually that means the first met's short. Is it abnormal? No. No, second most common foot. But if the tripod's on the ground, you've got the, the heel there, the fifth toe and the first toe, and the first toe's short, where's the foot going to go? Right. And that foot designs are usually different. They'll have a shorter arch relative to the length of their foot. So when you measure for shoes, you have to measure arch length as well as toe length. Not nowadays, it doesn't really matter because they all come out of China anyway, the bloody shoes. So, but essentially when you measure well, that's what you're looking at. And the orthotics no different. If the orthotics are looking identical, they're machine made and they look beautiful, fantastic. Maybe they ain't gonna work, but they look good, which is the main thing. So, and that, and that, there's nothing wrong with a Band-Aid if you actually tell the patients the Band-Aid and they know it is. So the problem with my orthotics, and none of them ever look the same, 
and they're always per foot, not per feet. And that's what you've got to look at. Don't just look at one foot. That's the sore one. Let's make everything the same. You've got to look at both, which I would imagine your therapies are the same as well. You know, you never not treat the other side, but you don't treat it as intensely as you would the one that's damaged. Same with the orthotics. Um, pronation, it's in your notes. So low arch foot, flat foot, pes planus. And basically, a flat foot is a congenital deformity. If you don't have that bone structure of a flat foot, you don't have flat feet. You might have an arch that collapsed, you might have an arch that's on the ground, you may have an excessively pronated foot, but it is not technically a flat foot. Okay? Does it to happen in one general population more than others, like Asians, for example? Uh, what, flat feet? Yeah, flat feet. Oh, I don't know about that. I think, um, I think it's misdiagnosed. I think in Asians you're looking at a lot of tibial varum which means that the foot structure's got to adapt to the ground differently so that the arch is lowered, but I don't think it's a true flat foot in an osseous, osseous frame of mind. Best way to test that, stand someone up, arch is on the ground. Sit them up, arch is not on, the, the arch is there, not flat footed. That's in simple terms. That doesn't mean the foot's not weak, but it's not a true flat foot. Because you, know, you look at orthopedic terms and look at textbooks, flat foot you can't treat. Flat foot's flat forever. So why are we putting orthotics on all these people that are flat footed? Because they're not flat footed. They are operating perhaps in a flattened position. So a different difference in definition. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and that's why pronation is not a problem because it's a combination of things. You know, if you pronate, if you don't pronate, you're stuffed anyway. So you have to pronate and supinate. So structural imbalances, subtalar joint, mid tarsal joint, hypermobility. Well, hypermobility, double joint, joint laxities, that's not abnormal either, but it does tend to put you in a risk category because gravity is a bitch, pushes you down, and you've got to fight that laxity. And if you don't have the muscular capacity to help the ligaments that are already lax, obviously you get problems. So orthotics help a lot with people that have hypermobility. They also reduce the incidence of ankle sprain because it helps to reinstate some of that proprioceptual balance between the muscles and the, and the ligaments. Just going to try and go a bit faster. Supination, opposite, not as common. That's why there's no shoes available for them. Last shoe in the running phase was uh, ASICS made a shoe for a supinated foot, lasted on the market for one round, which was about three months because it didn't get enough sales. So don't kid yourself that the shoe companies are out there trying to make good shoes for you. They're out there to make shoes that sell. So if the shoes don't sell, they're gone, off the market, uh, nowhere to be seen. So that's a disadvantage to that section of the population. So even having an orthotic, if you start whacking them in good runners, and uh, they're a Kayano or they're a, a Brooks uh, Diction or something like that, you're gonna over accentuate their control factor because they need to have either a neutral shoe or even a, a lateral control shoe. So then you've got to sort of stick to some of the neutral shoes like the, I don't know, the ASICS 2050 or something like that, the mid-range mid type of shoes for those type of people. Um, and the basis with uh, supinated fit, feet are hypo, hypomobility, more, more common, stiffness, increased shock absorption. Um, so both lot flat feet, supinated feet get uh, back issues, but sometimes for different reasons. So that can be compression of disc because of impact, um, as well as posture along those lines. So pronation, signs of, you know, you get calluses on the inside of your foot more often than not. So. Uh, fascial problems because they tend to be stretched when they don't like to be stretched. Uh, vascular problems, the reason you get vascular problems is entrapments but also the fact that the muscles don't work well. If you're flat footed or flattened in the arch and you're not using the calf muscles, you're not pumping the veins back as well as you should. So you start getting some, some issues with circulation, especially as the patients get older if that's a continuing thing. So even putting some form of correction on, can, if it helps the muscular balance, can help the long-term circulatory effects to the leg, um, even uh, 
a little bit of restless leg, some of those minor ones where they're not severe, sometimes it's just because the, the mus musculature is not working well and just needs to be helped along. Uh, then the mechanical heel spur, valgus, all that we've talked about. Uh, supination, you get a lot more rotationary movement. So obviously the foot's not going to flatten. So when they take off, they get a lot more rotatory movement. So you get um, intractable corns. So you get those calluses on the middle, but you get those corns that go right in and the patient can hardly walk. The toes will come contract. Neuromas, um, sinus tarsi syndrome, as I said, retracted digits, Taylor bunions, and even the fact of the bumps on the back of your heels. The, Exostasis start because of the different traction from the uh, Achilles. Yeah, okay. Effect on posture. Now, I did say I was a clinician and I'm not a scientist, right? So, the fact of do orthotics work to help people with posture? Yes, they do. How they work, I've got no bloody idea. I think they're still working on a lot of the reasons for it. I mean, there's a mechanical reason. You, you supinate the foot. Um, the uh, Dannenberg and Gluermo did an effective ankle dorsiflexion, calcaneal bone curvature, hallux extension, so that all that walking pattern we talked about, um, which uh, helps to propel in the sagittal plane, changing the, changing the emphasis through, through the spine because you're basically, when you're walking, your pelvis has got to move. Um, you're also, depending on where your pelvis is, creates strains. And you start here. So if your foot's down, your pelvic's going to be in a different position. It's going to take longer for you to get around. So then you've got some stresses coming just from the fact that your stride length's different, um, as well as impact and things like that. Um, so according to, the, to them, they're talking about a straight pronated foot, internal rotation, rotates the hip, tilts forward, uh, lordosis in the, in the spine, gives you back issues which is, yeah, fair enough, but I don't think that's the only one. And they haven't done really enough studies on that to really prove whatever. But I do know, I've put orthotics on patients, so I've got rid of, rid of headaches, I've got rid of back pain, I've got rid of uh, hip pain, I've um, just uh, improved their general posture, including cerebral palsy. You know, they start off walking like this, and then you put orthotics on them and they're walking like that. They still walk badly, but they walk better and that means there's got to be some sort of relationship with changing their, the, the, the position they're in and the stimulus that they're getting from the ground. And remembering that everybody's on that hard flat ground so we have to change that stimulus. So whether you look at the orthotic changing the ground surface to suit the foot better, um, it's a bit more than that I think, but that's what you really got to look at is trying to change that mechanism and the question of where you find a practitioner that's going to help you there, you have to look because a lot of foot, a lot of podiatrists look at the foot and they don't go past the ankle. They don't have the skills yet. I mean, they're all doing courses there and they're always studying, but it's not necessarily something that's taught in uni. You get your basics, obviously, as you guys would know, you get your basics and you improve your skills as you go along. So, Yes, and that's the only time. I might, put an ortho I might put a heel lift on a functional leg length discrepancy for a short period of time if the symptoms are acute in the back. So somebody with as big as say 35 millimetres, you would still lift it right up to that? No. 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 Guidelines would be you would perhaps start at 50%, use that for three to six months, so yeah, see what sort of... Big pardon? Would you eventually go to the full distance? Depends on what your aims are. You know, is it a young patient? You want to stop any, um, you know, adaptation of the spine in the future? You might. If it's a 70-year-old, why? Get get them out of pain. Yeah. And then, depending on your level. You